Celebrating the connection with our pets, this is Animal Radio, featuring your dream team, veterinarian Dr. Debbie White and groomer Joey Villani. And here are your hosts, Hal Abrams and Judy Francis. And welcome on today's show, Katherine Schwarzenegger. Does the name sounds familiar? Uh, yeah, I only know one Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Yes, yeah. and this is the daughter of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Arnold and Maria, and she has a book out. She's a big animal lover, and I think, and we'll find out, I think growing up with Arnold and Maria, she had a lot of pets. They, That's They're awesome. big pet lovers. That's pretty so sure. cool. And she's written a book, it's a, ch- a children's book, mm-hmm. about a dog called Maverick, which I believe is uh, a dog that she still has. Awesome. So she'll be on the show in just a couple of minutes right here on Animal Radio. We'll also find out why recognizing and treating fear, anxiety, and stress in your pets are so is so important. Are so important? Stress. That would be three. Are so important? What's the grammar, Lori? <laughs> it's, it's, so they, it's they are. They are so important. Why yes, they are just... so important. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're the only one that's gone to college here for a few years. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> At the bottom of the hour, we check in with our news director, who's also gone to college, I'm sure, uh, Miss Lori Brooks. How are you doing? Okay, today. Um, got a story coming up, and Dr. Debbie, you're going to like this one. Or maybe not. Um, it's it's kind of like uh, the vet says blank, the client thinks blank. And when you think you're talking about either like preventive care, vet office visits, or worse, the internet, Dr. Google, um your thinking might not be on the same page as the other. Mm. You love Dr. Google, don't you, Doc? You know, Dr. Google's frustrating. <laughs> so frustrating. <laughs> I won't even mention Dr. Google to my vet anymore. I like Dr. Google for the background, but when Dr. Google is held as an authority over your veterinarian that you're facing face-to-face, um, that's when I have a problem. But I do like people kind of get in the background info that know the right questions to ask before you go to the vet. So you like you like them to ask questions. You like them to be informed, but you don't want them to be making a diagnosis from Dr. Google. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Don't forget you can also ask your questions from the free Animal Radio app for iPhone, Android, and BlackBerry. And we go to Robin. Hi, Robin. Hi, Dr. Debbie. I have a quick question. Uh, I have uh, two elderly dogs, and I don't know who's going to be who to the grave, including myself oh, no. here. <laughs> but uh I am wondering, uh, I, uh, way back when I was uh, a young girl, we lost a, a treasured Irish setter I'd grown up with when we had him, had him boarded, and he got uh, over-sedated because he was barking so much. And uh, it just occurred to me lately, would, would that be any uh, euthanasia alternative uh, if... A, a person just administered an overdose of a sedative uh, uh, orally, and it would avoid the two shots that are the usual procedure now. Mm, I see. Well, you know, sorry that happened to your pet, but it sounds like that was long, long time ago before we have developed a lot of uh, better information and drugs with anesthetic safety and sedatives. And there are definitely pets that should not be sedated because of underlying health risks that can make them perish, um, you know, while they're sedated and can't control their airway well. Um, but I guess in answer to your question, um, I don't advocate that. And I get that question a lot is, you know, is there something you can give me to give my dog at home to let them die peacefully at home? And the, the answer is, um, I can't guarantee that death will be swift, painless, and anxiety free. And, and that would be why I wouldn't encourage anybody to go that route because there certainly is the possibility we could have an overdose situation, but we could also struggle to breathe and have a pet that is in distress, um, whose last moments on earth are very agonizing or very drawn out for a very lengthy period of time, or that doesn't actually work. And we've just put them through a very devastating experience before. So for me, I would say I very much embrace the, um, 
the peace of a good euthanasia, and that's having a catheter in place, giving a sedative prior to giving uh, penobarbital, which is generally what's used for euthanasia in animals, and doing that in a controlled um, manner that we can make sure is um, peaceful and loving for both family member and for the pet. Um, so Okay, well, I did plan to have uh, the vet come to my home, so that okay, good. keeps the vet... Uh, Experience of anxiety going to the vets, uh, you know. Uh, Minimizes that, that, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. uh, I've always been curious about that, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your call today, Robin. We appreciate it. Well, you lucky dog, don't forget you can get your fix of Animal Radio anytime you want with the Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's made possible by Fear Free Happy Homes. Helping your pets live their happiest, healthiest, fullest lives at home, at the vet, and everywhere in between. Visit them at fearfreehappyhomes.com. And thanks, Fear Free, for underwriting Animal Radio. Austin? Hey, Austin. Hey, how's it going? How you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Just enjoying the nice sun. I'm down here in South Carolina, so... (laughs) What's going on with your pets? Um, I got a Chihuahua, and we got him from the ASPC, and we're just wondering, uh, he's got two canine teeth on both sides of his mouth. We thought they would fall out when he got older, but now they're still there, and I was wondering if that would be something, you know, we're going to have to get taken out or just go ahead and leave it. Okay. And how long have you had your little friend? Um, he's about a year now. We've had him for about four months. Okay, very good. And is he having any difficulties eating, um, any sensitivity with his mouth? No, not that I noticed. Good, good. And I didn't think you were going to say that because what you're describing is a very common um, problem what we see in small breeds of dogs, especially the toy breeds, um, and it is retained deciduous teeth. So basically we, all dogs have a set of puppy teeth, and those should fall out and be replaced by adult teeth. Very commonly, these little baby teeth don't fall out. And if you're seeing the little hook teeth behind the adult canine teeth, and yeah. if your doggy is that old already, um, they probably will need to be surgically removed. Because um, in most cases, we give them until maybe eight months, ten months. If they don't fall out and they're in there nice and solid, then we need to go in and remove them because there will definitely be the potential for uh, problems with crowding, um, abscesses on the baby teeth. Um, but because, especially because those teeth are so close, they get a higher rate of dental problems. So yeah, I will definitely give you the prescription to get those teeth yanked out of there. Okay. And I have one more question. Um, about like three days ago, first time it's happened, he acted like he had a seizure. Ooh. And uh was wondering if, you know, just keep an eye on him or maybe should well, we talk to him about... He just acted real wobbly. He'd stand okay. there, his head would shake, and, like, his legs would wobble and stuff, and he just sat there and looked at us, and yeah. that was the only time it's happened, and he's been fine ever since. Okay, and there was nothing that happened right prior to that that had you concern, no injury or jump or fall or anything like that? No. Not that okay. I know of, because, you know, we got him from the ASPC, you know, and I yeah. mean, he's been, that's the first time anything's happened, so... Yeah. Well, I, I would be suspicious what you've described could be some form of a seizure. And um, I'm always of the type, I don't like to let things go. Um, so I would definitely yeah. bring that to your veterinarian's attention. And I would probably want to get a blood sample on your little baby um, to check okay. for a couple things. Because small dogs can have problems with low blood sugar issues. And then they can also have some liver problems that we might pick up on a blood panel. Um, but if oh, everything okay. checks out good, then I'd probably just, you know, make sure we track this. And um, from that point forward, make sure we keep track if he has more of them. And then we know what degree of concern we'll have to have from here forward. So, uh, well, golly. Well, I'm glad you saved a life, Austin. That's awesome. Um, everyone should adopt. It is such a wonderful thing. Do smaller Thank dogs uh, generally have more problems? It seems like you seem to mention that smaller dogs have more dental issues. Sometimes they have more digestive issues. 
Yeah, I don't want to single them out. Uh, but there are some things that we see more typically in little dogs and in some of these congenital problems, the baby teeth, very common with the little breeds. Um, but the big dogs, they have just the same share of things. They just kind of are a different spectrum, maybe hip problems or heart problems or other things. So, no, I'm not going to single out the little guys. <laughs> You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now with the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's Alan Kibble. You know I love dogs. They constantly make us look at ourselves. This is the best frisbee catching dog on four legs. She's awesome. And this is the best frisbee catching dog on three legs. Her name is Macy. Fell in love with her the minute I saw her. She was my perfect dog. She's the only freestyle frisbee catching dog on three legs. She had an accident, and that right front leg had to go. It was heartbreaking for me. She was my perfect dog, and I thought, oh my gosh, she's not going to be perfect anymore. Macy, the dog, doesn't think about being different than she was before. She has taught me so much. She's just taught me acceptance and humility. You know, she sets no limits on herself. Maybe Macy will never be the best frisbee catching dog in the world. No, she's not going to win. She's not going to place. But it's not about winning or placing. It's about the adventure of life. <laughs> That's one of the amazing things about dogs. Macy doesn't think about being different from other dogs. She just thinks about getting that Frisbee. Now, what are most people always doing? I always wonder what's going on in his head. Trying to figure out what's in their dog's head. Like when she runs out of the front door and just starts chasing after people. Dogs get really interested in people that are afraid of them. It brings out their prey instinct. They get excited and they want to chase you and she doesn't hear me saying come back Roro no oh she hears you all right she thinks you're joining in and she doesn't respect you as her leader if something's more interesting than you are the dog's gonna go for it unless the dog respects you and respect has to be earned by giving a dog boundaries limitations structure stuff like that or like when she eats my shoes you haven't taught her what she can't chew and what she can't here's what most people do you are so sweet tons of affection for a dog without having to make them earn it they're questions that have been around for as long as dogs Dog owners have gotten dogs and not educated themselves about dog behavior first. Why he might chew a bedpost or why he might eat your socks. The reasons behind these things, which I knew, wish I knew the answers to. You should know the answers to him because he thinks you're playing a game when you chase after him and because you haven't taught him what he can chew and what he can't. Get more tips at AnimalRadio.com. How would you like to save money on nearly all your prescription drugs? We've set up a special toll-free number for the RX Outreach Program. They're a nonprofit company whose mission it is to make prescription drugs more affordable to the masses. They don't take insurance, and in many cases, your prescriptions are even cheaper than your co-pays. They carry thousands of different prescription drugs, so whatever you're taking, there's a good chance they have it. No coupons are required, and this is not a discount card. It is pure savings on your prescription drugs. They specialize in generic meds for any chronic health needs you have. Call with your prescription and find out for free how little you can pay for your prescription drugs. Remember, we don't take insurance, so call right now. 800-689-0143. 800-689-0143. 800-689-0143. That's 800-689-0143. This is Animal Radio. I'm always right. Well, of course you are when you're right. <laughs> Even when you're wrong, you're right. I, I'm a Leo, so I know I'm always right. Oh, my and God. You are. My as dad soon is as, a Leo. Yeah, as soon as everyone understands that, then we get along just fine. <laughs> That was funny because as a kid, I would be like with my dad. It's so hard because I wanted to do my own thing, but my dad would say something, and I knew that my dad was always right. And I was at conflict with myself because I didn't want to do what he said, and I didn't want to believe it, but I knew he was always right. Mm. How did life change when you realized that he wasn't always right? (laughs) You know, what, I, he he really is. He's a deep thinker. I, I I think he's he's got a lot of stuff figured out. I don't know if it's a Leo thing or not, but worked for my dad. It is Animal Radio. If you want to talk to the always right Dr. Debbie, uh, give us a call right now, and uh, we'll put you on with her. Line two. Hey, Valerie, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Where are you calling from today? I'm in Oxnard, California. The Nard of the Ox. Lovely Ventura. Yep. So what's going on? Well, I have a a two-and-a-half-year-old little boy, and I'm thinking about getting him his first pet. I'm not sure what to get him. Oh, so you have a a new baby. Bird. He likes cows. He likes horses. So I just I don't know what to get him. Okay. Well, what what kind of pet experience have you had as a uh, adult? 
I've had a cat and dog, fish, rabbit, birds. Okay, good. So you have a good, well-rounded background. So that's the, the, the biggest thing. And I think it's great to get kids into or get pets into households with children. Um, they learn so much about responsibility, respect for um, animal life. It's it's a really wonderful thing. And I wish I would have had pets when I was that young. I actually didn't have pets until I got much older, believe it or not. But uh-huh. now the challenge is with Valerie, with your son, he, he's a bit young for a lot of responsibility, handling, um, safe handling, and also even some increased risk for zoonotic diseases. So diseases we can get uh-huh. from animals. So with kind of all that in mind, it does kind of whittle down some of our suggestions. And I actually, for kids that age, I would start with something as simple as fish, um, uh-huh. goldfish. Um, um, particularly some of the fancy varieties can be really cool for kids to watch. I, I as a kid, actually trained my goldfish um, to follow my finger. And it was, you know, it was a great um, first pet for me. So I would say that would definitely be one of the the best things. Um, okay. Otherwise, you can get into, um, you can also get into something like hermit crabs, which um, uh-huh. have a rel- relatively, you know, uh, simple upbringing. Don't, the, um, don't they have pinchers on them? They do, but it's, you know, when you compare that, when you compare that to, say, you know, a rat's teeth or a cat's oh. claws, the damage sustained is very minimal. Okay. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is kind of watching and learning, so we don't, I wouldn't say a two and a half year old child should be putting their hands in the cage with a hermit crab, but um, you know, but that would be one to kind of grow up with and to watch and to learn about how we feed them and changing the water and all of that. So those would be some good things. But uh, maybe as we get a little bit older, um, I actually one of my favorite starter pets that are furry is actually guinea pigs. And the reason I love these guys is guinea pigs have, you know, great little personalities. They rarely bite. Um, They usually like to be handled. Um, You know, they do require their cleanup and the care, so that would fall upon mom. (laughs) That's why I asked what kind of pets you've had. Um, But they really are one of the best rodents that I like to start into. Um, Really, in some of my my guidelines for kids and pets, I under five years of age, I don't like introducing any reptiles into the home. And that's really because oh, of right the risk now. of um, you know, bacterial diseases like salmonella. Um, yeah. And so that's a really big thing of staying away from reptiles and amphibians until the kids are, you know, older and or, you know, some kids may be more responsible under that age, but um, yeah. it really is the dependent on the kid. Um, well, maybe and, but, we'll stick with, uh, with the fish and he can get some fish by his third birthday. Yeah, yeah. And then what I also do recommend is, as much as it may be fun to put the pets in the room with kids um, of that mm-hmm. age, um, I would make sure you do have it in a different area just so um, you don't have accidents. Um, you make sure you're supervising hand washing after kind of yeah. handling in the area, all that kind of stuff. And then always making sure um, a lot of things we This is something I never thought of before I was a, an adult is when you clean your pet's bowls, uh, food items, cages, you don't want to use any kind of sinks that are used for human food prep. Uh-huh. Or bathroom areas. So preferably things like laundry room sinks would probably be the better thing um, Uh because you'd have to disinfect any of those sinks that you would use, you know, to bathe your kid or anything like that. Yep. so, yeah, well, okay. that's great. Hopefully you'll, your little one will grow up with um, some interesting little creatures, and uh, it, it could spur a lot of great things. Yeah, well, de- we'll definitely keep that in mind. We're still thinking about it, so maybe we'll start off with a little fish or two. That's the way I started with the kid when I when I was a kid. Was My first animal was a fish. Then I moved on to a, a rat, I believe, after that. A wow. rat? Yeah, a little uh, Seymour. <laughs> with the big darts. Yes. Oh. <laughs> they all do, all those boys. <laughs> yeah. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now with the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. Dogs or cats, horse or emu, animals are people too. A cat in Columbus, Ohio, helped save the life of his owner by dialing 911. Police aren't sure how to explain it, but they received the 911 call with no one on the line, so they sent over help. 
When they got there, Tommy, an orange and tan striped cat, was lying by the telephone. His owner, Gary Roshism, was on the floor near his bed where he had fallen out of his wheelchair and he couldn't reach his medical alert necklace. Roshison said he had tried to teach Tommy to dial 911 on the speed dial before, but he wasn't sure if the training stuck. Police officer Patrick Dougherty says he knows it sounds kind of weird, but he can't seem to find any other explanation. Roshison just calls Tommy his hero. I'm Britt Savage for Animal Radio. Animals are people too. Animal Radio. If you're living with diabetes and using insulin, you know the pain of pricking your fingers over and over again. Ouch! Well, by wearing a small remote device called a continuous glucose monitor, or CGM, you can reduce the pain of pricking your fingers. If you administer insulin three or more times per day or use an insulin pump, call now and learn how a CGM can help you. Painless. No more pricking my finger. No finger pricks. Convenience. They delivered it free and they took care of all the paperwork. You can reduce pain right away. Plus, it's accurate, easy to use, and helps you spend more time in range. And if you have insurance, you can get a new CGM at little or no out-of-pocket cost. Call now and get free shipping of your new CGM. Plus, we'll bill your insurance for you. 800-785-1673. 800-785-1673. 800-785-1673. That's 800-785-1673. Hi, this is Brandon McMillan on Animal Radio, and be sure to adopt and not shop. This is an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit fearfreepets.com. I'm Lori Brooks. The world of pets is vastly expanded in, in every which direction over the last few years. And now, my friends, researchers are studying the world of you as pet parents and how specifically you make decisions about your pet's care. And one of the things they found in a new study is that veterinarians and pet owners see the world differently, or maybe more accurately, we hear different things. So, for example, when it comes to preventive care, pet parents believe it involves their pet's emotional well-being. It's kind of all-encompassing. It includes exercise, nutrition, play, and medical care. But veterinarians see preventive care as spaying and neutering, providing vaccines, and setting up a parasite control program. So be careful of what you say to your vet and make sure you're both on the same page. Uh, Another example about vet office visits. For vets, they view the visit as a chance to evaluate and determine the best course of action for the problem that, you know, you're going to the vet for. But for the pet owner, they think it's to get expert advice to include in their decision-making process. In other words, they're going to add it to what they already know or further plan to research. And when it comes to Dr. Google, I know we've all done this, uh, most vets will hate it when you say, well, I searched the internet and I found, in fact, it's so bad that I actually make it a point to never, ever say those words to my vet now. Because this new research shows that most veterinarians think the internet is a dangerous and misinformed place for the pet parent to take a chance on their pet's health. And frankly, now I agree. But for pet owners, the Internet comes to be an on-demand source of huge amounts of information that they can use to make decisions concerning their fur baby. Uh, But some of that information is incorrect. And I know Dr. Debbie is one of those doctors. She will go ballistic if you walk into her office and say, well, Google said this or (laughs) WebMD said this. I got a big lecture on that one time. I had a a cat who had an abscess and I I thought for sure that it was cancer because it was pretty hard. And so when when the vet came out, because she was a mobile vet, I said, oh my God, I was like in tears because I thought, oh, she's going to tell me that, you know, my my cat has cancer. She said, see, you made yourself worry all weekend and yada, yada. I was like, okay, I'm never saying that again. A Southern California woman now has a new pet frog. Ribbit. 
after finding the distressed tiny thing in, of all places, a large container of lettuce mix that she bought at a local Target. But actually, she had already made her salad. She had poured on the dressing. And she was just about halfway through eating it when she saw something in her bowl was moving. Oh. And it, too, okay. was green. Yeah. Now, now, mind you, this woman is a strict vegetarian. So she quickly scooped up the little frog and she rinsed all of the dressing on it. But she noticed that the frog was barely alive. So they actually did chest compressions on it. Frog CPR, if you will. And it survived. So the frog's name is now Lucky. He is the couple's pet. Uh, but uh, also want you to know that the woman says that she was so traumatized as you can imagine after this, that she vomited after finding Lucky in her salad and said that she has no desire ever for a vegetarian, especially, and no desire to ever eat salad again. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's not good for a vegetarian. Now, any, no, word, no. any word on how that uh, frog got in the salad? Um, no, but she did reach out to Target, which is where she, <laughs> okay. you know, they have grocery stores in some of the stores. Enough said. And they offered her, I guess because she reached out online instead of privately, and they offered her a $5 gift card and told her that they were investigating it. <laughs> That's all? That's all you get? That's $5. it. Oh, God. If I found a frog in my salad, I, I, I would be so mad. See, I can understand this if she picked the vegetables in her yard and, you know, just right. got in there. But in a bag that's supposed to be, I don't know, Inspected. approved. Yeah. Yes. And and hopefully pre-washed. I mean, that poor frog. Think about what it's been through. Jeez. <laughs> There's a dog up in Oregon now uh, who has been honored by the local sheriff for digging up $85,000 worth of what's called black tar heroin. A really highly prized form of heroin, and it came from the family's backyard. The 18-month-old golden retriever, retriever, uh, highly active, of course. You know, he's very young. Uh, dug up what his family thought was, hey, you know, a time capsule. So they decided to video themselves opening it. Thought this will be a, a great thing to post. Well, then they saw the contents. Oops. Off went the video, and they found 15 ounces. That's almost a pound of heroin, which I, I guess is like a powder. I'm not that knowledgeable about yeah, drug yeah. stuff. I don't know. But to show their appreciation from law enforcement, the sheriff named the pup an honorary narcotics dog for life. How about when the people have to come back to dig that up? Do you have to start worrying now, you know, who buried that in your yard? I mean, I don't think that's a small amount. I think that, you know, when somebody comes back to claim that one pound of heroin, um, you kind of have to worry a little bit. It's time I, th- to I think you're absolutely right. You, you know what? You got Now they got to get another dog. They got to get a bigger dog. They got to get an 85-pound um, Staffordshire Terrier to now guard the rest of the property. So... Whoever comes back, you know, that's all well taken care of. I think they need to keep the golden retriever to keep digging. There's probably more. Oh, I didn't even think of that. You're right. You're right. That's a good point. It's just, it's just crazy, but I, I'm with Joey. I, I think that's really, really scary because who knows what kind of colorful characters will be showing up trying to find that, and that's a lot of money. You know, God knows what they could do. But we wish them well. I'm Lori Brooks. Get more breaking animal news anytime at AnimalRadio.com. This has been an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. The veterinarian isn't typically thought of as your pet's favorite place to go. With Fear Free, that all changes. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. Hi, this is Paul Reiser, and you're listening to Animal Radio. Every minute you're here, you're not harming someone else. I don't know what that means. <laughs> if it's usable, use it. Otherwise, cut it and get out. Hello, Animal Radians. It's Robert Semro, your Pet World Insider, here with this week's Animal Radio List. Ten ways to prepare now for a pet emergency. I want all of you to safely stop what you're doing and think for a moment. If an emergency situation happened right now, what will I wish I had done for the well-being of my pets? We all feel like we have things covered and that we have what we need if an emergency were to occur. But the sad reality, and we've all seen the news reports, is that things can and do happen when we are least prepared. 
So we here at Animal Radio are hoping that you'll take 15 minutes this weekend and reassess what you have for your pets, what you need for your pets, and what you would do with your pets during an emergency. All three of those will likely have different answers and issues to consider. To begin with, let's start with the legal needs, meaning important paperwork. Do you have a copy of their vaccination and medical records, proof of ownership, maybe your dog license paperwork, and definitely a few photos? This serves the dual purpose of not only reuniting you with your pet if you're separated for any reason, but also for shelters that allow pets. Many of them will ask for this type of information. Next up are the living essentials. Do you have enough food and water in the case that you're on your own for a while before help can establish a return to normalcy? Remember to periodically rotate these items and check them. Additionally, if you had to be mobile, could you take some or all of it with you? This applies to medications as well. Do you have enough for at least a week so that if you had to flee or shelter in place, your beloved pet would have the medications it needs? One of the best tips we can give is to pack these materials in a quick grab-and-go manner. It might be in a backpack, plastic bin, or other easy-to-travel container. Inside this grab-and-go should also be a few treats, a favorite toy or two, an extra leash, and poop bags. And I love collapsible travel food and water bowls for this purpose. Other items to include would be a pet first aid kit, a pet first aid manual, wet wipes and a blanket or towel which can serve multiple purposes. All of these things should be ready to go mobile if need be. And long before the need arises, you should also check with your local authorities to see what the plans are for pets in an emergency situation. Some shelters allow humans and pets while others don't. And some have specific plans for pets of all types and how they will be housed and cared for in an emergency. Knowing this ahead of time will help you plan and give you focus and reassurance during that critical time. The more you do today, the better off you and your pets will be. So Animal Radians, share your pet emergency preparedness planning tips on our Animal Radio Facebook page. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now with the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. Hi, this is Joyce Dewitt on Animal Radio. Please stay and neuter your animals. Thank you. Life can be full of risks. One thing you shouldn't take a risk with ever is your family's health insurance. If you're self-employed or you now need affordable health insurance, you need to make this free call right now and see how the health insurance helpline can help you get it. 800-472-0658. 800-472-0658. 800-472-0658. That's 800-472-0658. Hello, this is Jane Goodall on Animal Radio, and i just like everybody to realize that each day you live, you make some difference on the planet, and you can choose what kind of difference you're going to make, and hopefully every day you'll try to make the world a little bit better for people, for animals, and for the environment. This portion of Animal Radio is underwritten by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. It is Animal Radio, celebrating the connection with our pets. We'll head back to the phones for your calls, and we welcome to the show for the Fear Free series, Dr. Lisa Radosta. She is the owner of the Florida Veterinary Behavior Service. Doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. What causes fear and anxiety and stress in our pets? What kind of things? Well, the first time that your dog goes, or your kitty, we can't forget about kitties, uh, or your bunny, your, your pet goes into a veterinary hospital, most of those pets are naive to what will happen. They're pretty uh, open. Well, she seems nice. She's wearing a white coat, but... She seems like a pretty nice person. I'll let this uh, I'll let this experience happen. But once we poke them and prod them, even in the name of helping them, they realize that we're probably up to no good. <laughs> and unless there's no effort, or even if there's just a little effort but not enough effort, to mediate that fear, that can 
can grow and it can really snowball very quickly. Most of the pets, and this is absolutely my observation, but I'm here also uh, to talk to you about science. The studies that have been done in cats and dogs show that most, we're talking 80% most for sure, are afraid at the veterinarian, want to leave immediately after the exam is done or the vaccines are done or the tests are done. So they're a little scared. So they're a little stressed. How does that really affect them? Oh, that's a great question. So when you are scared, you, myself, dogs, cats, bunnies, horses, when animals are scared, there's a physiologic stress response that is outside of their control completely. And that starts in the brain and the neurotransmitters in the brain control that entire body. And that starts in a nanosecond and that entire cascade occurs in seconds. So that feels like a tight chest, a stomach that's upset, tense muscles, panting, a heart that's racing. So we want to say, oh, you know, you can get over it. But when it's physiologic, it's not a get over it moment. Mm -hmm. It's a moment where we have to do something external to help the pet get over it, quote unquote. Will going into stressful situations often uh, wear down an animal? Will it cause them problems in the long run? Yes, it will. And I would, I would like you to think about if you worked at a job you hated and there was no way you could get out. It's outside of your control. And every day you went um, and think about just how emotionally stressed you would be. And again, we go back to the neurochemical stress response, which snowballs into a chronic stress response. And yes, it beats them down. What we see is that these kiddos, these little furry kids, have a shorter fuse, let's call it. Especially at the veterinarian's office, it takes less and less and less for them to act as if they are fighting for their lives or to hide under the chair or to urinate or defecate on themselves. Absolutely. And chronic stress in the home setting has certainly been linked to other emotional disorders in pets, but also to suppression of the immune system and to some dermatologic problems. So we want, we want our pets to live happy lives as much as we want ourselves to live happy lives. Well, what's one simple thing we can do to reduce the fear, the anxiety, and stress in our pets? One simple thing you can do, if I had to choose just one, I would say understand your pet's body language better. Because our biggest fault as pet parents, as veterinarians, as veterinary care professionals, is not reading the dog or the cat properly. Hmm. It's not looking and knowing how often, I cannot tell you countless times, I have sat with an owner and said, your dog's tail is tucked. That means he's scared. And that person has said to me, really? The clients that come to see me are fantastic. These are not... These are not people who don't care about their pets. They love their pets. They just have no clue what those fear signals are. So if I had every pet parent could read their pet well, they would be aware. And awareness is always the first step, isn't it, when you have a problem to solve? We've been talking about creating veterinary offices that are fear-free. But there's a brand new program part of Fear Free. It's called Fear Free Happy Homes. We're trying to make the home lifestyle fear free without the anxiety, without the stress. Give us a couple of uh, hints of what we can do to make our home fear free. That's really important because I want to preface it with if your home isn't fear free, that doesn't mean you're a bad pet parent, right? Right. We all have um, our the places in our lives where we lack knowledge and this might be a place for a pet parent to grow. Um, and help their pets. And number one, enrichment. And cats, especially enrichment, enrichment, enrichment. Because I'm a runner, for example, and if I don't get to run, my family actually brings out my running shoes and pushes me to run (laughs) because they tell me that my attitude is poor. Let's just put it that way. They have some descriptors for it that I won't share here. But I need that enrichment. And cats and dogs need that as well. Every age, every breed, every species can have an enriched life. Check out Fear Free, fearfreepets.com and fearfreehappyhomes.com. And of course, links to everything you've heard on today's show over at animalradio.pet. 
Dr. Lisa Redosto, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and thank you for the wonderful work you're doing with spreading the news that we can make pets have happier lives. Well, Judy, I want to thank you very much for the invitation to go over to your brother's this weekend. Uh, It was nice to meet him. First time I had met him. And I see his brand new puppy. I know. Isn't she so cute? Her name is Mia. No, I noticed while we were there that uh, they're using the, the the cheap old blue puppy pads. I, you know, I was really surprised that he would use those cheap things. They're worthless. Why haven't you told him about Wismart? Well, I didn't know. Now I know <laughs> what he's using, so I'm turned him on to them. So we're sitting there, and the dog goes over to pee, and then the, the dog walks a little bit in her pee, and then she starts racing around the house. You know how they make that little race afterwards? Hops up onto the uh, couch. Uh. And Mia's track and pee all over the place. And I see my brother's wife running after her with paper towels and some cleaner. For you regular listeners of Animal Radio, you know we have a brand new puppy too. But we were lucky enough to be turned on to WizSmart pee pad. We use the Ultra pee pad. The reason being is really quite obvious. The pads are thick. They hold a lot of moisture. And Pixel, the Animal Radio Studio Stunk Dog, does not track anything around the house. No, you know, and you can just tell by looking at them. Compare the two side by side. There is no comparison. You can visually see how thick they are and how absorbent they are. Now, I noticed your brother had to pick up a pad every time she went to the bathroom. We don't have to do that. These pads hold up to eight cups of uh, fluid of your choice. In this case, uh, well, you know, and we change it out like once a day. Now, for you environmentalists out there, you probably think that these thick pads are not very environmentally friendly. But in fact, they are made from deconstructed unused diapers, getting a second life. And that's why they absorb so much. Not just for puppies, but also for elderly dogs or dogs that are ill. Visit their website at wizsmart.com. That's W-I-Z-S-M-A-R-T dot com. Or check them out on Facebook and Instagram. Celebrating the connection with our pets, this is Animal Radio, featuring your dream team, veterinarian Dr. Debbie White and groomer Joey Villani. And here are your hosts, Hal Abrams and Judy Francis. And if you would like to speak to Dr. Debbie right now, if you have questions about your pet uh, behavior or health-wise, or grooming questions for Joey Villani, the dog father, uh, you can also ask your questions from the free Animal Radio app for Android and your iPhone. So download that puppy right now. And we'll go to the phones in just a couple of seconds here. This hour, Catherine Schwarzenegger, the daughter of Arnold 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 Schwarzenegger. I, I can't do an Arnold impression. No, I don't think anyone in the studio can do an Arnold impression. I'm not even going to try. Arnold. If, Dr. Uh, Debbie, come on. <laughs> yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger. There you go. That's I, pretty good. I stand corrected. <laughs> She's always right, you she know. She is always right. <laughs> the daughter of Arnold will be on the show, Katherine Schwarzenegger. She's a big animal lover. And there's no question why, because she was brought up with animals, not including her, her dad and mom. She, uh, of course, had other animals and dogs and cats and uh, I believe kind of a farm-like existence where she lived. We'll ask her about That's it. That's so find cool. It. That is cool. And she wants your kids to grow up loving animals. So she's written a kid's book called Maverick and Me, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit about it in just a few minutes right here on Animal Radio. Hi, Sheila. How are you? I am wonderful. How are you? Good. Where are you today? I am in South Lake, North Carolina. North Carolina. Oh, listening on WFNC, I assume. Yes. So what's going on? How can we help you? I have the whole team here for you. God, I hope somebody's got some good ideas. I have <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know I can count on you guys. I have a 13-year-old Norfolk Terrier who hates cats. I don't know how else to put it. He just hates them. Aww. And the area that I moved into has several abandoned cats. And I have fancied one that loves me, and I love it, and I do not want to think of it even being out in the winter time. So I'm trying to integrate it into our little family. And Bailey is very resistant. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to change his mind. What is he doing? He'll be, he'll, I try to separate them with like a gate, mm-hmm. and he just sits there and barks and barks and barks and barks and barks. And if by chance I'm able to coax the cat to get closer, he snaps and lunges. Oh, dear. And oh. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah I, okay. I'm afraid he, oh, he would. He's already hurt one when we lived in Oregon. So. Really? What did he do? 
Well, she was an old gal. She was about 23 years old, oh. and he got a hold of her and ended up breaking two of her two front legs. Oh. And Yikes. I'm sorry, I have a hard time even talking about this. Oh, goodness. I, I took her to a vet, and they said she was just too old. She couldn't go through the surgery. Yeah. So I had yeah. to have her put down. She wasn't even my cat. Oh, but golly. I would have paid anything to fix her. And I just... Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. So, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, well... I just love that's... animals so much, and I can't stand the thought of anything or anyone hurting them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, especially for those of us that love both dogs and cats, you know, we want them to live in harmony. Um, But that can sometimes be a very tall order for certain animals. And what varies between dogs, and especially breeds of dogs, is essentially their prey drive. And, um, you know, it's especially terriers. Terriers are wound this way. When you look at kind of what they were developed for, you know, they were, most terriers were kind of raised and housed to help control vermin. So part Uh of their job was to chase small things that ran fast. So this is an instinct. This is something that is within their very core. Now, not every terrier will do this, but it is something you have to be aware of because instinct, you can't train that out. And right. there are some dogs that have a high prey drag, whether they're terriers or other dogs, that you have to right. respect that. And for a dog that has physically injured a cat or, say, a small dog, I really could not even advocate a situation where we would bring a cat into the household um, because it's so hard to overcome this prey drive. Now, there are training steps we can try, but I'd have to say as a veterinarian, I have seen so many cases of what you had to go through before and that it once that drive is satisfied and, you know, we're successful, we either make the cat run away or we physically injure it. It actually kind of reaffirms this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, that's very hard to come over. So I would have to say I would not recommend bringing a cat into the household with this dog. Well, then <laughs> could you maybe counsel me on where would be a good place to t- I don't want this cat loose in in the yeah. winter time and he's already been loose in this area for about 2 years before I moved in here and I you know I got him and he's fattened up and he's just very social mm-hmm. yeah. and I don't want to take him to a kill shelter yeah but I would <laughs> rather see him in a you know shelter in a cage somewhere than be injured or hurt or spending the the winter out here in North sure. Carolina Sure. And, and I, it's going to be hard for me to help you with your specific locale because that does vary um, on the sheltering situations in different areas. Um, you know, I will tell you that there are feral cats that live outside in the winter. Um, they, these different, um, uh, I was going to say tribes, <laughs> you know, th- these different colonies of cats um, can live outside and they do have their ways of getting out of the elements. But otherwise, I would have you, you know, reach out to your local shelters and um, see what kind of resources they would have for a this no-kill shelter. This guy is not a feral. He, he doesn't, he's not afraid of dogs. Mm-hmm. He um, is very social. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's belong. He's been in a family. You can tell by the fact that the minute you open the door, he wants to run in, and yeah. it's hard to get him to go back out. So I've just oh. stopped letting him go back out yeah. for fear something will happen to him in the meantime. Yeah. Well, I, I would you know definitely delve into those types of resources locally and see what you can do. But in the meantime, the, the things that you know I would ask you to do to help protect this cat would be to always have physical distance between them, and I would not really set this up where you know Bailey's going to be in a position where we're giving the opportunity to lunge um, when we're trying to train do- animals and dogs to, to not have so much of a prey drive and to try to control their impulses we would use something like a head um, a head halter um, uh-huh. that is one way to control where the nose goes so that would be one thing um, to train him to accept that and to use that when you are you know maybe have to move Bailey around nearby the cat because then you'll have control of the head and we won't have an unfortunate snap or a bite um, I also have to take into consideration that Bailey's 13 and I don't want to stress him out any more than mm-hmm. is necessary either sure yeah and you know, and you know I can tell you how we I can tell you how we train you know 
focus and, you know, how we, you know, get a dog to sit and, and behave calmly when something like a cat is nearby. And, you know, that's how you basically train them to try to not chase cats. Um, but mm-hmm. for a dog that's already, you know, caused such a serious injury, that that's the reason I'm really not advocating that kind of training for for Bailey's sake. And, and yes, you know, I understand you don't want to put him through a lot of mental stress as well. All righty. Well, I guess okay. I need to look into no-kill shelters in the area and take this little guy up to uh, one of them and then just cry my eyes out. <laughs> oh, well, I, you know, this is a tough one, I and mean, I, I wish I could make you comfortable that you can keep this kitty, but I, I just have to say that... Um, I want to do what's best for both of yeah, them, for the cat yeah. and my dog. Yeah. Oh, well, good luck mm-hmm. with things, and um, I, I hope that baby finds a, a good forever home. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell them, if they do not find a forever home, please don't put him down. I, I will do whatever I have to do. I'll build another house for them. Yeah, hey, I, that's an idea. Yeah, a cattery. Not, you could do that. I am, I'll build that, pardon the pun, a cat house. And uh, I, I just won't let them put him down. He's just too sweet. He belongs with somebody, an older person maybe who doesn't have mm-hmm. uh, a, a pet that would just love a lap cat. He watches television oh, with me. How cool. Oh, he's such a cool cat. Does he have favorite television shows? Actually, we watch Zoolander, <laughs> but he loves listening to the radio. And hopefully we animal radio. listen to pet radio. Yes, there you go. He, he has good taste. Well, Sheila, please keep in touch with us and let us know how this turns out. If you need any further assistance, we're here to help you, okay? I, I will do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sheila. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now with the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. Hi, it's Alan Cable. A couple weeks ago, a Kentucky police officer, Jason Ellis, was shot and killed in a suspected ambush. He had a canine partner. His name was Figo. At the funeral for his best friend and partner, pictures were taken of Figo with his paw on the coffin. Figo's been retired now and will live with Officer Ellis's family. Here are some news people commenting on the photo. Oh Just gosh, an incredible so photograph. Sweet. There. It looks like beautiful. he's grieving there. So he sweet. Is. The dog definitely knows from the scent that his former best friend and leader is in that coffin. You know, a dog relies lies on his sense of smell to interpret the world, much the way people depend on sight. This weekend, while I was out walking my dog, there's a fountain, and he was taking a drink. He likes to lay down when he's taking a drink. He's such a big dog. Gets hot real easily. While he's doing that, another dog comes up from behind him and begins sniffing you know where. Anyway, my dog just keeps drinking, paying no attention. He's been around people and other dogs his entire life. I socialized him a lot when he was a puppy, and I continue to do that. So when a dog circles around back to give the old snifferoo, as long as he has good manners, my dog will let him. Well, the human couldn't have been more upset. She runs up and starts scolding the dog to leave my dog alone. Leave him alone, he's trying to take a drink, she says. I started telling her that this is how dogs learn about each other. This is the way they greet each other. That the rear to another dog is like the face to another person. She didn't hear a thing I said. She wasn't listening. And I could see the look of disgust on her face. I could see what was going on in her mind. The thought of putting your nose, you know, just makes some people very uncomfortable. That's because in the human world, you'd never do that. Although I think it would be funny if you did. We walk up and shake hands or we give each other a hug. So there are certain things that dogs do because they're dogs that most humans would never dream of doing. So when some folks see dogs acting like dogs, it grosses them out. It's an important lesson. Dogs are dogs. They don't see the world the way you and I do. They see the world with their noses. And those noses are gonna go, well, everywhere. So smile, sit back, and tell yourself, that's my dog. Get more tips at AnimalRadio.com. Check out Animal Radio highlights. All the good stuff without the blah, blah, blah. Browse on over to AnimalRadio.pet. Hi, this is NASCAR driver Corey Joyce on Animal Radio and uh, spaying new to your pets. How would you like to save money on nearly all your prescription drugs? We've set up a special toll-free number for the RX Outreach Program. They're a nonprofit company whose mission it is to make prescription drugs more affordable to the masses. They don't take insurance, and in many cases, your prescriptions are even cheaper than your co-pays. They carry thousands of different prescription drugs, so whatever you're taking, there's a good chance they have it. No coupons are required, and this is not a discount card. It is pure savings on your prescription drugs. They specialize in generic meds for any chronic health needs you have. Call with your prescription and find out for free how little you can pay for your prescription drugs. Remember, we don't take insurance, so call right now. 
That's 800-689-0143. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now with the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's Animal Radio celebrating the connection with our pets. You should see us in studio. We all have our pets here. We're lucky that we can bring our pets to work. A lot of people can't bring their pets into work. Yeah. I just can't Best imagine. job ever. Yeah. Yes, it is. Now, if only Animal Radio would offer pet insurance, that would be cool. Oh, yeah. We should talk to them about that. I think they're pet friendly. I yeah. think they are. So they, we may be able to convince may them. May be I, able I don't to. Know. Awesome. <laughs> we shouldn't be airing our dirty laundry on the air like this. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to the phones for Dr. Debbie in just a couple of seconds here. Catherine Schwarzenegger right around the corner. And Lori, what are you working on over there in the newsroom? Um, is it good or gross to let your dog kiss you on the lips? Yes, what science yes, yes. says and what some of us feel. See, I can't let my dog lick me on the lips. She can lick my chin or she can lick my I nose. See, you lick her on the... Oh, the, the nose is no different, huh? No, the nose... You know, I used to have dreams where I would be married to a dog. So <laughs> that's it. that could go really gross. Don't even go there. But I'm just saying, I love them. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just... I draw the line at the lips. So what's the difference between the nose and the lips? Because they're they're awful close. Yeah. Dogs shove them both in the same place. Yeah. Your dog especially. Your dog eats Kitty Roca. Yes. Yes. yes <laughs> Doesn't even have to have the Roca on it. He, she'll just eat Kitty stuff. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, there's science on it, and there's our, our feelings on it, and we'll talk about it, okay? Okay, that's on the way in just a couple of minutes right here on Animal Radio. But first, your calls. Hey, Myron, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you doing today? Well, let me introduce you to Dr. Debbie over here. She's probably the best vet in the country, and hopefully she can help oh, you with whatever's you. going on with you. Oh, okay, hi, Myron. Cool. Hello. How are you doing? Very uh, good. I have a cat. He, she's about 10 to 12 years old. And uh, Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday, she went into the closet and wouldn't come out. She wouldn't eat. She didn't even use a restroom in the closet. And she was uh, hissing and scratching she, like she didn't want them to bother her. Okay. And I was wondering what was going on with her. Yeah, okay. Now, um, is she the only kitty in your mom's house? Yes, yes. The only the only pet, I should even ask about that. Yeah, yeah, she's the only okay. pet, and she, and she don't even go outside. She hasn't been outside in a couple of years because she doesn't even like going outside. Okay, and then is there anything going on in your mom's house? Have we been moving, new people, visitors, anything different going on? No, no. My mother doesn't usually have visitors except for family. All righty. Well, when a cat does this kind of unexpectedly, and we, we do a lot of sleuth work first, that's my first step, is I like to really look at the things that we don't think might be upsetting or a problem. So I've had cats freak out when a new sofa chair was moved into a room. It's, certain things can freak them out. So we really have to look at that, make sure there's nothing that we can identify in change in the environment, change in people, animals, or routines in the house. All of this is very important, making sure even the litter um, location substrates haven't changed changed. Um, if something has freaked her out, made her fearful, just she may be retreating and completely hiding. Um, but the thing that concerns me is it doesn't sound like we got a lot of different changes going in and it sounds like your mom's home is pretty stable there. Um, so the first thing that I worry is that there could be something medically going on, whether it's something painful or especially if she stopped oh, I, eating. I forgot so, to say, yeah, she stopped eating, right. So that definitely is, that raises some real red flags that we could have a medical problem. And, and as much as we might want her to tell us when something's a problem, some cats, they, they do this and it just makes it harder to help them and to know how to approach that. So we have to be cautious and safe because if she's hissing and growling and not wanting you near, you know, certainly we want you to be safe in approaching her. Um, but, um, there are some things you can try to kind of lure her and to, to get closer to her, hopefully so we can confine her, contain her, look at her. Or even just getting her to a carrier and to have your vet take care of things and do a good thorough exam. Um, so for me, if it's a closet, you know, we can definitely keep that area quiet, contained. Um, there are feel-away type products, which are pheromones, which are 
natural scent hormones that can have a calming effect. That could be something we can spray in the room to kind of help kind of simmer her down, hopefully kind of take the edge off a little bit. Um, for cats, we use food as a reward. So if she's not eating, we can't really do a whole lot in that realm. But things like tuna fish, um, some really stinky canned cat foods, if you heat those in the microwave, those can be very appetizing. So that might be a way to kind of gain trust, um, to have her allow the approach of either you or you know your mother to, to kind of investigate things further. But we're really going to have to get her, I think, to a vet um, to make sure that we can identify if there's something wrong medically. Um, and, you know, it, it has to be within your comfort zone. But I've had folks where, you know, they take a, a large blanket, um, kind of toss that over kitty, and then safely kind of scooch them into a, a box, a cat carrier, or something, so that we can um, move that exam, you know, to another site where, you know, we have professionals that can get a good look at her. Um, but but I, I share your concern. It definitely sounds like something we need to get her checked out pretty soon. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your okay. call. I appreciate it, Myron. And, of course, uh, we have the uh, Go to Your Vet. Jingle singers, please. Go to your vet. Hey, a little more pet, please. Go to your vet. Yeah, I like that. And go that is, that is to cool. your vet. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now with the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. Dogs or cats, horse or emu, animals are people too. In efforts to stop the deer overpopulation in New Jersey, Morris County researchers plan to try a new kind of birth control for deer. The deer will be injected with a hormone-releasing drug that should make them sterile for three to five years. If successful, the drug could be used around the state to curb a white-tailed deer population that presents a frequent road hazard to drivers. Some tips for avoiding a deer are learning to recognize high-risk situations, noticing deer-crossing signs, and being careful while driving past wooded areas near lakes or streams. Deers are social animals, so if you see one, look out for others. They usually roam at night or early in the morning. Looking out for your safety and the safety of our dear friends. I'm Britt Savage for Animal Radio. Animals are people too. Animal Radio. If you're living with diabetes and using insulin, you know the pain of pricking your fingers over and over again. Ouch! Well, by wearing a small remote device called a continuous glucose monitor, or CGM, you can reduce the pain of pricking your fingers. If you administer insulin three or more times per day or use an insulin pump, call now and learn how a CGM can help you. Painless. No more pricking my finger. No finger pricks. Convenience. They delivered it free and they took care of all the paperwork. You can reduce pain right away. Plus, it's accurate, easy to use, and helps you spend more time in range. And if you have insurance, you can get a new CGM at little or no out-of-pocket cost. Call now and get free shipping of your new CGM. Plus, we'll bill your insurance for you. 800-785-1673. 800-785-1673. 800-785-1673. That's 800-785-1673. This is an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit fearfreepets.com. I'm Lori Brooks. USA Today had a great article recently, and if you didn't get to see it, I wanted to share it with you. You know, I love dog kisses. Um, I kissed a dog and I liked it. And, and you might feel the same way, or you might feel like Dr. Debbie and go, oh, oh, too many germs for me. But this article cited a ton of research and experts who are both for and against dogs licking humans on the lips. For example, there are more than 700 different types of bacteria in a dog's mouth. And that's just normal bacteria. That is what you would expect to find in a healthy dog's mouth. Two vets from Atlanta say there are two special cases that you should be concerned about kissing a dog. 
One, if a dog licks someone who has a weak immune system, maybe someone who has cancer or an autoimmune disease. And number two, if the dog has a medical condition that it could spread, like gum disease or intestinal parasites, because with those, there is a risk for cross-infection. Now, most experts say if you were aware of what your dog puts in its mouth, you probably wouldn't even want your Fido to kiss you. I know exactly what my dog puts in his mouth. I see him cleaning himself all the time. Yeah, but consider all of I mean, there are lots of nasty things. And when I started reading this story, because I'm always, I'm like a staunch dog kisser. Uh Love it. But I read this story and I thought, you know, it really made me see Dr. Debbie's side. So, you know, because they do have their their lips or their mouths very close to other dogs' butts because that's what they do. (laughs) And then they, they walk outside to go potty and they lick their feet after stepping on who knows what. Some dogs, God knows, they eat poop. And the list goes on and on and on. So... I don't know. I hear this, and then about five minutes later, I'm like, okay, I'm over that. Kiss me. (laughs) So, you know, use your common sense and your own judgment when it comes to kissing dogs, because the experts say, on the whole, there really isn't enough data to show whether or not dog saliva is healthy or unhealthy for humans. But one doctor who is researching this subject says that she's heard many personal stories from people on both sides of the spectrum, and she doubts both of them, but those stories were one who claimed their dog's kisses healed them from skin cancer, and another person who actually believed that dog saliva caused a family member's death. Oh. So, the, the, yeah, the bottom line here is experts will admit, this is what I think, but we just don't know. We need more research, so be careful. I'm with Dr. Debbie on this one here. And I know that Judy's actually with you, Lori, on this one. Uh, Dr. Debbie, of yeah. course, she... I don't know. I let the dogs kiss me. You do let the dogs kiss you. Yeah. E- even, though you've seen where, even though you've seen where they've been licking, where they've been cleaning just before. You want to know something? And I know all the studies. I know about the salmonella, and I know I know all. I mean, we... We, we used to teach it in, in grooming school and tell the students don't do it and, you know, do as I say, not as I do type of thing because I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big pet lover and I don't know if I, if I ever can change. Let's put it this way. At 52 years old, I've been kissing dogs on the mouth all my life. You know what I'm saying? And, and I shouldn't say, you know, what can happen because obviously something can happen maybe at some point, but I don't know. Now we, I'm just a pet lover. I'm going to have to say, Joey, you know, we're, we're looking at this the wrong way. What are your animals going to catch from you? <laughs> there you go. You know what? You might you might be right. You might be right. And that's what that's what my um my my bird vet says um, um that you know that when when we share food she says not what you're going to catch from the bird it's what you're going to give to your cockatoo. So you're right. right. We've done those stories recently that say that there are a, a number of studies that show that obese pet parents can make their pet obese by just exchanging saliva because it's what it, yeah. what's in yeah. the gut that matters. That's right. Yeah. We did talk about that. Well, I love my pets, and I love them in the sense where I don't have to kiss them, and they don't have to kiss me. We show affection in a lot of ways. So I think that's just it. For me, I focus on, you know, there's the, you know, Nikki just loves to be next to me. You know, she doesn't, she's not an ostentatious dog. She doesn't have to kiss and lick. She just is really present, and that's how she shows her love. So I guess I don't have the overly licky dogs that I have to kiss them back <laughs> well wait, wait a minute i need to ask a question here because you just said something about saliva and obesity now i've fought obesity my basically my whole life so you mean to tell me that my saliva possibly can be a contributor of making my pets overweight well that was the research study that we just had on a few weeks ago that they actually have looked at the um the weight and uh, the bacterial population so kind of like you know the good bacteria that's in your gut um and then <coughs> those differ between pets and people that um have different you know zones of weight so thin people versus overweight people um so yeah they're looking at that as as a potential link in a way we can help manage uh, weight problems by managing the microbiome so there you go are are you my dogs don't have a lawsuit yeah (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. If you live in Arizona, you should know that fleas in two counties in that state have now tested positive for the plague and health officials there are urging residents to take precautions because the plague can be found in fleas rodents rabbits and predators that feed on those animals to survive but the plague can also be transmitted to humans and other animals through just a bite from an infected flea or by direct contact from an infected animal so you can limit your risk of exposure by avoiding rodent burrows and, you know, when you walk your dog, keep your dog on a leash so they don't get into it. And also not handling sick or dead animals. Remember to de-flee your pets routinely. Use insect repellents on yourself. And be aware that cats are highly susceptible to the plague. So be sure to use flea control on them and keep them indoors, especially in those Arizona areas. Yeah, that brings ahead, my question to me, too. Didn't didn't um, terriers, wasn't that what... Um, um, ridded um, Europe of the plague. What 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 the um what what what, what terriers basically and and actually killing, killing the rats and 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 reducing the population or was this, or am I missing something? Ter- terriers were ratters, definitely. Um, but yeah, because the plague was you know it's a it's not just a dog cat rat problem because of the flea vector so that's the real problem is the flea is what spreads that so that's the fleas from those rodents then expose the pets which can then expose you as a human so and the plague is actually it's endemic so in desert areas like uh you know las vegas area we have the plague um up on the mountains and um, different rodents have tested positive from time to time um so it is something to be aware of this is a reason why we don't advise people feeding wildlife and having them close to where your pets live because um, these kind of diseases can jump if they bring the fleas in yeah okay this brings to mind my i have a question from that story is it the health officials are telling people to use insect repellents but uh, mosquitoes are vicious to me I, I feel like i get eaten up every time i just step outside and i worry about mosquitoes because you know transmitting uh, heartworm disease and things so can you use a, a deep based or even a um uh, lemon eucalyptus based <coughs> insect repellent on your dogs? You can't use D on animals, no. Yes, no, just good due to the toxicity. Cats are really sensitive to some of the different essential oils, so I don't generally recommend using those for for cats. Um, the best thing I would advise is to really get a good flea tick preventative, um, whether it's an oral product um, or a topical. Um, you know, when we're talking something as, as bad as the plague, you know, I'm not a real fan of uh, gambling with, uh, you know, kind of the natural uh, remedies, you know, when safety is really a factor here. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. No, I just was kind of in a pinch the other day, and I thought, you know, maybe the uh, a new foster dog, and I just thought maybe this will help in, until they um, they get the the flea stuff shipped because I I'm like Hal and we know we don't like putting that stuff on them, so I'm I'm still in search of something that's they can take that I'm totally confident is not going to hurt them. There's nothing without a risk. <laughs> That's what we have to say. But there's a lot of great oral products now for people that don't like the, the idea of the topical, the grease. Really? Made. Tell me one. Um, Brevecto um, is one. Next Guard is another. Um, so, yeah, and they usually last for about three months of uh, flea control. So, yeah, check it out. Thank you very much. Wait, you got to love those millennials. I know you do because they are just kids. I call them kids, okay, because they're like 18 to 36 years old. Um, They love their pets, and they are truly the ones who are behind the idea of pets as family members and making animal lives better in every way than ever. And there's a new survey out that shows for millennials – Pets really are like their children, with one third of millennials who purchased their first home buying their first home because it had a yard and it was better space for their dog. I love that. Now, only 25% of millennials, however, bought their first home because they got married and only 19% because they had children. So for them, the pets come first. I'm Lori Brooks. Get more breaking animal news anytime at AnimalRadio.com. This has been an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. The veterinarian isn't typically thought of as your pet's favorite place to go. With Fear Free, that all changes. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. Life can be full of risks. 
One thing you shouldn't take a risk with ever is your family's health insurance. If you're self-employed or you now need affordable health insurance, you need to make this free call right now and see how the Health Insurance Helpline can help you get it. 800-472-0658. 800-472-0658. 800-472-0658. That's 800-472-0658. Hi, this is Jesse Tyler Ferguson from Modern Family. I'm on Animal Radio. Adopt a pet. You're listening to Animal Radio. If you missed any part of today's show, visit us at AnimalRadio.com or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's Animal Radio. Celebrating the connection with our pets, and on the phone with us is Catherine Schwarzenegger, yes, daughter of Arnold and Maria. Catherine, we welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Fine. Where are you? You sound like you might be driving. I am in, I am in Los Angeles, California. I want you to tell us about Maverick. Maverick is uh, now a story that you, you've uh, put together. It's a kid's story, Maverick and me, but it, it comes from your heart because it was your animal. Yes. Um, I have a... a real life dog named Maverick. He's three and a half years old. And I wrote this book, Maverick and Me, about my experience with fostering dogs and eventually um, adopting my dog, Maverick. And I wanted to write the book because I think it's such an important thing to talk about with children, especially when the time comes for them to be getting their first pet that they know that they have the option to adopt or rescue um, their first animal. So where did Maverick come from? He, um, I was actually working with this woman in Santa Monica at the time who was, um, you know, who I was helping foster different um, puppies that came in to her store in Santa Monica. And um, just kind of when I thought that I was done, I had gotten seven or eight puppies adopted. And I thought I was kind of going to take a break for a little bit. And she got a call from a downtown veterinarian who had found a two-week-old puppy under the freeway and needed to stay with somebody who could give it the attention that it needed because he had to be fed through a syringe since he was so young. And so she called me and she asked me if I could take it as a favor to her. And so I took him, and um, and he got really sick when he was little. So I developed a very strong bond with him very quickly that led to me eventually deciding to adopt him. So let's talk Schwarzenegger for a second. Uh, Mom and Dad, Arnold, of course, you just mentioned had pets when you were growing up. What What, yeah. what, what kind of animals did they have? Um, I mean, we grew up with dogs, um, for sure, when we were little. A lot of um big dogs and we grew up riding horses and being around them we also uh when i was in high school i got a pig and we had ducks and rabbits so uh (laughs) both both my parents grew up on farms and i think that they felt that it was really important for us kids to grow up uh with animals as well just because i think it teaches you so much about responsibility too to have your own own animal and be responsible for them and feed them and take care of them and um that was a big deal in our family so So we grew up, luckily, around uh, a fair amount of animals. (laughs) It seems like your dad would be kind of a dog guy, that he would have a dog. I imagine he probably has animals now, huh? Oh, yeah, definitely. My dad loves animals, and my mom loves animals as well. Um, You know, we still have a miniature pony that's at my dad's house, and he has dogs, and my mom has dogs. And we, you know, we grew up uh, being huge animal lovers in our family, so we all um, continue that as we get older. (laughs) Catherine, I remember when your mom and dad got married, so I kind of feel like you're you're part of my family right now. <laughs> I know, so long ago, right? <laughs> are they uh, are they strict disciplinarians with the animals, or, or do they? I can imagine dad probably allows the dog in bed and and is, spoils him or her. I mean, both of my parents, I will say, love animals so much, and when I was growing up, it was always fun for my friends to come over because it was a free for all with the animals we had. You know, the pony in the house, the pig in the house, ducks, rabbits, the dogs. It was kind of like it was the the animals were treated as people, So, um, which I think is so amazing. And it was such a fun childhood and uh, makes for great stories. So both of my parents loved that, that atmosphere and environment. Where can we get the book? Pretty much anywhere? Amazon, I imagine? Well, it's avail- yeah, it's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. It's available for purchase. And you designed it for children of what age? 
Um, really of any age, I think probably the sweet spot is um, probably like six to 10, maybe, or 12. Um, I think that, you know, kids now are so curious about getting their own pet. And I know that when, for me, I, when I got my first pet, it was such a huge deal for me. And I didn't really know about dog rescue or the ability to adopt or rescue a dog. And um, I know that the reaction from my little cousins and kids that see my dog, they think that it's so incredible that you can get a dog that has a story behind him and that, uh, you know, a lot of kids come up to my dog because he's brindle and they're like, that dog looks like a tiger. Where can I get a tiger dog? So (laughs) just to see how kids have reacted to me having Maverick and, and wanting to, you know, learn more about him and how I got him was really what caused me to write the book because you see such curiosity in children and also the excitement behind them and the idea of getting their first pet and being able to tell their friends like you know this dog came from the street and you know i was able to give him a home and love him and nurse him back to health is such a a fun thing for kids to learn about and um and there's so many amazing dogs and cats and animals that are you know in need of forever homes and have tons of love to give so if you can please do it so adopt, don't shop. Exactly. I'm looking for 10 parents right now that would like to introduce their children to this book, Maverick and Me, written by Katherine Schwarzenegger, the daughter of Arnold and Maria. If you're not lucky enough to get on through, head on over to Amazon and order this book up right now for the kids. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, what fun we had today. I hope you enjoyed yourself. If you find yourself looking for a fix during the week, you just need that Animal Radio fix, head on over to animalradio.pet or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone, Android, and BlackBerry. Bye-bye. Bye. There, just a dog. (laughs) And I liked it. This is Animal Radio Network.